Um, hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I really appreciate having the opportunity to hear our uh, research. So, um, today I'm going to talk about adapting and coping how to bring it out of social power change in light of um, I will start with a figure which is a uh, dis uh, distribution map of cumulative confirmed cases of COVID-19 in China. So, um, if you look at here, this center very open. Um, this darkest light color area, this is Wuhan city, which we found the uh, first confirmed cases in China. And uh, I guess on, um, December 2019, and since then the coronavirus just spread out through China and now become worldwide. So, um, and since then the uh, depression is, seems very common under uh, this situation. We can see your very, um, their free study have to do such research. Um, a survey conducted with more than 15,000 respondents in the UK document that around 29% of them have general psychiatry disorder and 35% of them feeling loneliness and, uh, during this pandemic. And another online survey which conducted to access psychological responses of healthcare workers so that um, Sixty-four percent of healthcare workers have symptom of depression, and more than a half um, of them feeling anxiety, and forty-one percent feel stress. And yeah, another in uh, another um, survey conducted in Hong Kong found a like similar effect, and more more than twenty-five percent of them. The participant reported their mental health have deteriorated since the pandemic. So this study tells us, like during the COVID nineteen, many people have such depressive experience. So our research is interested in how to prevent this depression. And previous study um, demonstrate that social support. Social support factors, media use, and circadian habits, and so on, are the potential are the potential factors that can help with this depression experience. And we mainly focus on the size of the social networks and the um, um, strength ties. So speaking to the size of social networks, um, we study have validated some potential factors. Uh, some um, uh, some smaller networks, they're likely to access social support and have higher level of depression symptoms. Or have they score uh, higher in the uh, mental health test? And a larger social network also mean you have more resources and contain large amount of um, social capital, um, as predicted by uh, conservation of resource theory, when people experience more um, resource loss or um, resource limited uh, situation, like you know people lack of mask or um, facing job problems, they would try to get everything they can, and even a trivial resource again can become very salient and would yield more significant mental paid off. And therefore, we expect that under this very special um, circumstances, people would, um, a, a larger network will have a um, bigger effect, which means we'll have a, um, uh, 
will have a bigger effect in the improvement improvement of mental health. So this make us bring up our first two hypotheses. The first one is great, greater size of social network can mitigate the depressive symptom. And this buffering effect of social network is even stronger in a uh, more severe, severely heat areas. Um, and then we're moving on to the high strength. Um, so for pretty much of study have done in this area. They find out like weak ties provide people with access to information beyond those available in their own social circles. So you are not have a very strong tie with these people, but this this kind of tie will help you have a um, like wider information. Whereas say on the other hand, strong ties can constitute a base of trust and provide comfort in the face of severe change or uncertainty like during the COVID-19. And it can also provide emotional support. So because of this, we bring up another two hypotheses, which saying stronger social strength can mitigate the depression symptom, symptoms. And also this buffering effect is stronger in more severely heat areas. And moving on with uh, our and, uh, the data used for uh, our research, uh, research is the wavefront data of web-based longitudinal service focused on social network of Chinese college population. And 20, uh, 2047 res uh, respondents whom come from a re representative sample of college population in Wuhan city have participated. We use Eagle Century Network Research Mapper to collect detailed information on strands and uh, on the tie strength and the size of uh, uh, participant personal social network. And to calculate the tie strength, we uh, use factor analysis and the factor score, uh, which calculate from four relative questions representing three major constructs of this concept. Purpose by bird. So these four uh, questions, including frequencies of contact, duration of each conversation, how well you know these people, and how close you feel with these people. And we do uh, factor ana analysis on that and use that factor score to represent high strength. So for, uh, and then for social network size, the ecocentric network design asks each respondent to name the people who they are, th who they think they're, um, is most familiar with and they feel close to. And this measure will uh, range from one to nine or above. And this is represent your uh, social network size. Um, we will also use the Center for Epidemiological Study Depression Scale to measure the depression symptom. Uh, the higher you score means the severe or um, the higher level in your in, uh, uh, depressive experience. And here is the result. So as you can see in this figure, um, we found out the um, interaction between social network size uh, and confirmed cases are significant, whereas the uh, main effect is not. So um, we can have a uh, more information in this figure. So showing that with the uh, social network size increase, the um, the depression score actually go lower. So which means in a very severely heat area, um, the bigger size the um, the bigger uh, social network size actually help you do better with this depressive 
experience. Uh, but whereas if you are in a very safe area, say have no comfort case, cases or below to 20,000, it was, you would hardly, hardly tell difference between, um, you know, big size, uh, big social network size or small network size of the effect. And, um, and for the uh, ice run, we find we find out that both the uh, main effect and the um, uh, interaction between tie strength and comfort cases are um, significant. But in this figure, we can see when the um, <clears throat> when the tie strength go higher, so actually uh, going very positive. We we find there uh, with we found out their um, CSD, their depressive experience, their, it's not that much difference. It's not significant. So it means in very severely hit area like Wuhan or um, other very, uh, and other severely hit city, um, this have a very strong, um, relationship or have a um, strong uh, tie strength will not help that much or you can hardly tell the differences but uh, um, there is in a um, in other situation it seems might be helpful so based on this our conclusion is this buffering effect of social network size on depressive symptom become more significant while the strength of social ties matter less in society where more cases were reported. So mean, meaning like it's the quantity rather than the quality of social relationship tend to play a more important role in mitigating the mental health consequences as the pandemic intensifies. So back to our hypothesis, which means uh, our result support the um, uh, the uh, the uh, interaction hypothesis is the buffering effect of the social network size. It is indeed stronger in the more civil severely hit areas, but the main effect is not significant. And uh, the tie strength, it can, uh, they, it did have a very significant uh, main effect and also uh, support this hypothesis saying the buffering effect of tie strength is stronger in more severely hit areas. So our, uh, our conclusion implied that um, in a more severely heat areas, uh, probably a more wider social network can help more when you are facing a um, very severe depressive experience. It's, probably doing better than have a very strong relation time. And thanks for listening. Thank you, David, for your presentation. Um, are there any questions from the attendees? Now you can put your question in the chat box. I see. Kelsey already with uh, a question. Uh, so, uh, Hangi, uh, so I, I'm curious about your results and maybe you can just provide uh, perhaps an intuition. Generally, I would think that the quantity is more important, uh, sorry, the quality is more important than the quantity. Um, you know, there are questions like, uh, do you have somebody you can confide in, uh, things like that. So, but obviously this is an unusual situation. Uh, do you have any guesses as to why the quantity matters more in the COVID period? Thanks. Um, 
I guess. Uh, So, yeah, if you have this figure, you find like um, in the the, um, the uh, social network site actually have a very strong effect. So, um, there is in the same the the uh, Quality of the social network edges. Um, because of the shutting policies or other kind of policy, they will limit your way to have a connection with your, um, say, fr friend or in that kind of situation, it would like strongly hurt that. Um, that high quality relationship because you are not going to, you're not available to um, hang out with friends or, um, you know, uh, you get stuck at home. And that's not a very, uh, or maybe you can do FaceTime with your friend, but it's not a very effective time to have a, um, to get emotional support. And data showing it this way, that's my guess. Um, is it helpful? Uh, I'm sorry, your uh, microphone, I think, is a bit uh, challenging. So it's difficult to, to hear you. Uh, if I understand correctly, uh, one thing that's relevant, it, this is a particular age group, right? These are college students. And so yep. uh, they're unable to meet in person. So the, the quality is not as important as normal. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I, but uh, thank you. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Oh, thank there you. is. Um, uh, there is a question from the chat box, David. You can also open the chat box uh, from Ursula Wolski, and she asked, "Would you say that the types?" So variety and range of social networks are significant. Um, sorry, I can't see that. So I can also restate it. She asked, would you say that the types, so variety and range of social networks are significant? Um, let me share something. Like, also do some analysis on kind of to find out uh, answer to this question, you know, uh, we did like college type and um, you know uh, social economic status to try to answer this kind of question. But for now, we are not seeing a um, very significant result, or um, or result can help to answer this question. So for now, I would say um, no. For now. Okay, thank you. Enjoy uh, the um, relationship. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that we're all questions. I don't see any other attendees with a hand raised. Let me check. Then, David, I would like to thank you for your very interesting contribution. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> There's one other question by uh, Peggy. Peggy, you can ask your question after unmuting. Uh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. 
Okay. Uh, I was just wondering whether you controlled for uh, prior depressed uh, spells among the students, because obviously if you've had several in the past, it may be more difficult for networks to help, or um, I couldn't see whether you had access to those data. Um. So we're actually doing a cross-sectional study. So these students are um, coming from all around China. So they're being stuck home for a um, few months. So if there is this kind of fight, uh higher level of uh if you're um yeah so um that 2047 so actually we i think we will Um, is that answering your question? I'm sorry, I just couldn't hear you at all. So <laughs> it's maybe yeah, the best don't. connection. Yeah, we didn't hear the last part. Uh, the last part? Yeah, maybe you can re restate your answer. Give it one. Oh, okay. huh. so, um, make it more clearly. So these 2,000 students are coming all around China. So actually, uh, our, they, they, if you're doing analysis on them, I think they would balance the kind of uh, be, uh, pretty press, uh, different pretty press level, because uh, it's not reported that which city has a um, significant higher uh, depressed level and we are also planning to um, collab a, uh, a wave due data in next month so if there is that kind of bias or um, depressed effect on some of the students and make bias on our um, result uh, after see and um, see if I'm doing wrong on that but yeah, thank you very much for your advice. Um, is that answering your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, let me see. I think that were all questions, David. So many thanks for your fine contribution. And I will make you attendee again and we will move on to the next speaker. Good morning, uh, Cigar. Good morning. Good morning. Perfect. You can hear us, right? Yeah, we can hear you clearly. You can share your screen. I will do so now. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity for sharing our research. Uh, we will share with you our uh, small study on Solidarity through social media in Ankara, Turkey during the pandemic. Uh, we built our stud study on the argument that in times of crisis, 
support and solidarity within communities have significant influence on the well-being. During the pandemic in Ankara, we have observed successful utilization of Twitter by the municipality and the mayor, and that actually helped the citizens unite under solidarity and support each other for various in various levels. Uh, here in the study, we look at uh, data in, the, in Twitter through certain hashtags that were promoted by the local government and explore uh, solidarity as a component of well-being of the citizens of Ankara. Uh, firstly, I think I should give some information about our context. We actually come from the field of architecture, from the broad field of the built environment, and we are mainly interested in uh, how people relate to their built environment, where we think mediation and well-being are um, significantly of high importance. We are relatively new to the field of quality of life and well-being studies. We are trying to educate ourselves through online classes and readings and all. Uh, but as uh, we are just uh, starting, we are just taking our initial steps uh, into this field, we would appreciate any questions and suggestions for our research uh, at the end of the presentation. And um, in the current circumstances with the pandemic, uh, we have decided to uh, work on Ankara, focus on Ankara and uh, residents and the local government as urban actors uh, and mediation and Twitter as the tool of mediation and solidarity as a component of well-being. Uh, I will briefly talk about Ankara and uh, the situation here. Ankara is the capital of Turkey with a population of 5.5 million. And <clears throat> the city was uh, governed by its previous controversial mayor for 23 years until uh, 2019. Uh, relay, relay by the current major Mansur Yavaş has been considered by the community as a victory. Uh, since the previous elections were uh, apparently suspicious. So the major, mayor actually has the sympathy of uh, citizens independent of political standings. So actually during the pandemic, he did uh, kind of uh, utilize his connections to the community in a quite successful way. Uh, so kind of created an opportunity for us to uh, make this study. Uh, being the capital and one of the largest cities of the country, the city experienced almost all the, uh, all the restrictions in the country. Uh, most of them are quite like the rest of the world, restrictions such as restrictions on travels, uh, online education at all levels, shutdown of gathering spaces, uh, almost all of them. Uh, I, in addition to these, we had lockdown for citizens below 20 and above 65. And also we had curfews during the weekends and holidays for all. And especially these lockdowns and curfews uh, kind of required some extra support within the community, uh, especially for, for the elderly. Um, so uh, this also creates a ground for solidarity in our opinion. Uh, solidarity enhances community by creating and reinforcing social support, collectivity and sense of belonging, which are actually quite important to uh, support, uh, enhance people's relation to their built environment. Uh, so therefore it actually contributes to the well-being of citizens as being parts of these uh, urban environments. It also implies sensitivity towards the well-being of others. Uh, digital realm provides a, the required interaction and the space for these uh, phenomena and is actually kind of uh, overrides many problems that could have been observed if we didn't have the current technologies. Uh, mental uh, health was became one of the most significant issues as uh, 
everybody uh, is aware of and most of the research here in the conference uh, point out and pandemic challenged the mental health of the uh, citizens of Ankara as well and solidarity became more important than uh, before and uh, as proposed by who actually uh, solidarity is one of the considerations for mental health uh, during the outbreak and the uh, mayor was quite aware of this situation and actually the community itself was quite aware of the situation uh, and utilized Twitter uh, accordingly. Now Biggie will share with you the, uh, our data exploration uh, and then we will discuss the uh, findings. Okay, so I'm going to talk about our experimental study. I think it's important to mention that these hashtags that were used by us were uh, location-based, location-specific, and prior to the usage of these, uh, some generic hashtags were used, such as uh, six million people together and we are going to succeed together by the presidency, uh, and both of these hashtags were actually promoted by the local government. Uh, our first hashtag is Eylik Tahapulashici, which translates to English as goodness is more contagious. Uh, it was actually first used by a catchphrase, uh, as a catchphrase by the City Council of Ankara. Uh, and it was used in order to spread the uh, small uh, acts of goodness done by the citizens and share those with the others. Uh, then, as a hashtag, it was first tweeted out by Mansur Yavash, the mayor, and the uh, um, tweet is actually can be seen on the right-hand side. This tweet was actually what inspired this study and also what accelerated the solitary formation within the um, space offered by Twitter. And the usage of these hashtags actually resulted in further acts of uh, kindness, such as people sharing their food during the month of Ramadan and um, them helping elders with their grocery shopping. And it's also it's important to mention that the Ilik uh, hashtag was accompanied by the uh, campaign of Iftar Var, uh, which was uh, organized by the municipality and it was aimed at gifting iftars to the less uh, opportunity having um, citizens. Uh, Verisiya Defteri actually followed what Ilik Dahabulashici was doing and it was emerged out of the efforts, efforts of the citizens in doing uh, acts of kindness. Verisiya Defteri is actually a notebook that is held by the neighborhood grocers in order to record the depths of the customers. And through this uh, act, people with money were helping others and closing off their debts by going to the grocers. And it's important to mention that this um, organization was done self uh, by the um, society. It was not something organized by the uh, local government, but the uh, citizens actually uh, organized under, uh, organized by utilizing Twitter and uh, utilizing the solitary that was established within it. Um, for our methodology, we uh, gathered the tweets for the hashtags under the tweets for two different days. Uh, one of the days is a common day for both of them, and then the second day is where they actually picked the numbers. Uh, the first 20 tweets accessed via the advanced search tool on Twitter were collected and the keywords within them were extracted and categorized into three main categories. Uh, the first one is location and municipality, then social solidarity and then company hashtags. And a total of 385 quotes were gathered to be analyzed. Um, the tweets were most related to the location and municipality category with 145 quotes. This was an indica indicator that um, there is an important association between, between these acts of goodness and the municipality and that the municipality of Ankara is a leading factor of uh, the formation of solidar solidarity within the digital space of Twitter. And within the quotes, Mansur Yavash was the most used one. Uh, this indicates a successful utilization of uh, social media, which has been providing the inspiration to the citizens uh, in order to unite under solidar solidarity and participate in these communal acts. Uh, the category of social solidarity has 121 quotes. The quote that was used mostly was uh, goodness, uh, which is inspired by the um, hashtags used by the government local government. And it can be stated that in such time of crisis, people are actually uh, uniting around goodness and they are forming fellowship and solidarity and the citizens are now having more uh, established relations with one another. 
the coding for the category of accompanying hashtags were, was done by collecting uh, all the keywords that had a hashtag and uh, the hashtags were collected the hashtags collected were seen to be related to the other categories as well. So there were some overlaps between the uh, keywords of other categories and the hashtags collected here. And we looked at the overlaps and saw that social solidarity was um, more used and more it has more overlaps than the um, location and municipality uh, keywords. This shows us that there's a primary relation and association that people are having while tweeting about these uh, communal acts and uh, social solidarity, solidarity keywords. Um, so as a outcome of the study, we saw that during the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, Twitter was utilized successfully by the mayor and the local government, and it guided the citizens under, uh, to unite under uh, solidarity. And the emphasis on locality of Ankara and its relation to goodness is actually showing us that uh, the involvement of the citizens in the acts of solidarity provided for their associations to the physical environment. Uh, and even though people had been detached from their physical communal space by the restrictions, uh, they now have enhanced associations with their physical environment and with one another. And these uh, associations are now related with goodness and solidarity. Uh, and the digital space generated by these interactions within the uh, citizens cultivated an environment where the citizens had the opportunity to feel and observe a, a sense of continuity and community online uh, on the digital space. And as a result of these acts of kindness, they now have attached the uh, value of goodness to their um, physical environment and perceive Ankara as a center of goodness. <laughs> so um, depending on these results and uh, our knowledge uh, in relation to well-being. Uh, I will talk about a couple of concluding remarks, uh, especially in the in times of crisis. Solidarity contributes to the well-being of people, providing a sense of community and tangible support for the ones in need. So actually, it has a it ha it kind of feeds people uh, mentally, but also physically as well. So is uh, unquestionably a, a support for the well-being of communities. Uh, in relation to this, social media actually can be utilized as a powerful tool to create solidarity, therefore to enhance well-being of communities. Uh, it might be said that it doesn't happen uh, in this way all the time, but actually a conscious um, acts and uh, understanding of social media as a positive uh, and powerful tool uh, can actually create further ties among societies so that uh, well-being of communities can be enhanced by the communities themselves and also by the local governments. Uh, solidarity among the residents of a city reinforces sense of place and sense of community and these are quite uh, important uh, co uh, concepts phenomena uh, when we think about uh, the built environment uh, and cities and actually uh, any kind like in any scale uh, because it creates a belonging to the environment and a kind of a feeling of security and uh, safety within the spaces that we live in so uh, solidarity is quite important for uh, creating these attachments, these ties to the built environment. Uh, and then, of course, eventually, uh, you know, create a city with uh, well-being. Uh, and local authorities and creators of the built environment can and should serve the city through not only development of the built environment, but also enhancement of social structures. Uh, in Turkey, especially in our um, city, uh, in the uh, previous 23 years, let's say, we have seen uh, like very um, negative applications uh, in the built environment physically, which then kind of reflected upon the well-being of uh, the residents, but with the uh, new hope that is given 
to the uh, citizens and through these acts of uh, solidarity uh, supported by the local government actually we see a kind of a development in the well-being of the community you can even observe that uh, in the discussions in the daily uh, conversations among the residents uh, so we would like to kind of emphasize this for the area of study of the built environment because we think well-being and the power of social media in uh, supporting our communities and the built environment are kind of overlooked in our context uh, so in our further research we would like to kind of bring this issue into uh, discussion uh, for the for all the actors involved in the built environment uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, we would be glad to answer them. And if you have any comments or suggestions, again, we would appreciate any uh, support. Any thanks for your presentation. Are there some questions for the presenters? You can put your question in the chat box or you can raise your hand. Yeah, there's a uh, question from uh, Becky Schijns, uh, and she asks, you can also read it uh, together with me in the text box. Uh, I would be interested in terms of which people use Twitter in Ankara. I'm not an expert, but in the Netherlands, it is a selected group who uses the medium. So which type of solidarity would you be enhancing, depending on the background of the Twitter users? In other words, would you have any background of the users of Twitter? Uh, for the current research, we don't have uh, any information about the background of the uh, users of Twitter. But uh, in general, in Turkey, of course, the uh, people, the educated use Twitter more, maybe. But actually, uh, it is used by uh, various generations. So uh, even the elder generation is quite active in using Twitter. Uh, and also, maybe not only in relation to age, but also in relation to different political uh, views. Uh, uh, so the, it was kind of nice to see uh, people apparently from different uh, political standings uh, had have used uh, Twitter in the same way for solidarity during this pandemic. And if you ask, for example, have you observed that? For example, the uh, use of the hashtag for Ramadan actually is used by rather conservative uh, part of the community. Uh, but actually, the mayor currently uh, is from the main opposition party. So actually, it kind of created this interface uh, to create the solidarity. And apart from that, uh, when the solidarity is in question, actually, um, even the people who do not use Twitter benefit from this uh, act because people start to, uh, you know, uh, distribute this information among their neighborhoods, uh, neighbors and all, and uh, um, actually the local government started to announce that. And so um, actually many people, the elderly, and uh, many people, even who do not use Twitter, has benefited from this uh, acts of kindness. Actually, they got uh, support for food. They got their bills paid, uh, independent of their relation to Twitter. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Then we, uh, we have a follow-up by Anna. That's sorry. So we have a question by Kelsey. Uh, Kelsey? Uh, yes, hello. Uh, very interesting, I think, uh, potential policy intervention uh, from the mayor. Uh, so it'd be interesting if you could tease out, uh, you know, this use of Twitter from other policies, uh, but that may be challenging at the moment. So that just interesting aside. Uh, but I also wonder if you've considered looking at sentiment analysis. Uh, there are several people presenting in this conference using sentiment analysis on Twitter data. 
and you might see on the days in which or the or the hours in which the mayor has tweeted uh, or maybe some other pocket associated with the hashtag that the sentiment improves. So if you're unfamiliar, uh, there was a presentation earlier uh, by Stephanie Rousseau and Talita Grayling and a co-author, um, and they have another paper tomorrow. Uh, so it's very interesting and you may be able to extend it. Okay, thank you very much for the suggestion. Yeah. Any other questions? I have one question. So I find you very in the paper very interesting. And I, I was wondering, is uh, Ankara in a way an anom anomaly? So is this solidarity movement or policy really special to Ankara or do you see it also in other Turkish uh, cities? Actually, we have seen it in other cities as well. For example, for Istanbul, again, the local government of Istanbul actually, uh, you know, promoted such uh, solidarity acts, again, through Twitter and other forms of social media. Uh, and also, when we were looking into the data, we also were able to see the use of these hashtags in other uh, cities as well. Even in smaller cities, uh, they uh, became quite powerful tools uh, to create these kind of support issues. So it's not really an anomaly. Uh, okay. It's kind of, actually when it happens in larger cities, it kind of grows out to the other areas, which we think is quite important uh, because when it you know, happens in a smaller city, it's kind of harder to see it in uh, these kind of metropolitan areas, but when it becomes uh, an act in large cities, then actually uh, it spreads out to the whole country somehow. Yeah. Interesting. Are there any other questions? I don't see any more hands. Uh, then, I, then I would like to thank you for your very interesting contribution. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. We move to the uh, last speaker. Hi, Pauline. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. then let me share my screen. Okay, there I am. Yeah. So, um, we can see your screen. Pardon? Well, we can see your screen. Just okay. a all right, all right, all right. So thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Paul Intuku from Karatina University, Kenya. My paper is looking at the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the quality of life of older persons in rural Kenya. This study was conducted around May when uh, three months after Kenya reported her first case of COVID-19 in March. So at the time of the study, several restrictions had already been put in place. The schools had been closed, the churches were closed, the places of worship in general had been closed. Uh, travel restriction out of five counties, and that included three, the two major cities and other coastal towns. And so the older people in rural areas were having some issues that I thought might affect their quality of life. So uh, as we all know, we know that COVID-19 so far has led to major devastation in all aspects, socioeconomic and health. 
and UNDP described it as the greatest global challenge since the Second World War. So various leaders in different parts of the world have put various stringent measures to contain it as we all await a vaccine and Kenya is no exception. So these effects of COVID-19 are likely to have many long-term uh, effects on individuals and communities and the older people are likely to be among the most affected. So the quality of life in this uh, study uh, is seen as a multidimensional concept that refers to an individual's overall quality of life uh, and can be measured from different aspects. So the study has considered to measure it from the financial, from the social, from the health and psychological aspects. So the old people are considered to be most affected for uh, different reasons. One being that their quality of life has already been found to be positively related to social interaction. And remember, social distancing is among the requirements for containing COVID-19. Uh, severity of COVID-19 is also related to age, underlying health conditions, and other factors, including gender. So here, <clears throat> the older persons are advanced age, and many of them have underlying health conditions. So that means they are affected in that category, and COVID-19 makes them uh, really frightened. They are afraid if they get it, they might not come out of it. Then. Uh, older persons with age-related disabilities, particularly the very old, depend on other people to assist them in their normal functioning, to help them take a bath, to help them, uh, some of them to eat, to walk, and many other things. So they cannot do without the assistance of the others. And they don't know whether the ones who are assisting them are likely to be infected uh, with the virus. So. Uh, it becomes very complex for the elder persons. Uh, in Kenya, majority of these old people live in rural areas and depend on agriculture and support from their children, most of who work in urban areas. At the time this study was uh, undertaken, that is in May 2020, uh, travel restrictions from major cities meant that the children of these older persons were unable to travel to rural areas to see their parents. One, because of the travel restrictions, and two, because the government encouraged people uh, in urban areas where COVID-19 was more not to travel to rural areas in order to pr protect the older persons who are living there and were more vulnerable. So many younger people in urban areas, even in the towns that were not uh, under restrictions, uh, opted not to travel to see older parents in rural areas. And therefore, there was supposed, there was a likely element of isolation among these people, although not uh, many researchers had uh, decided to uh, measure it and to see the effect it may have on them. Then also remember that uh, because of uh, social distancing and physical distancing, many people lost their jobs. Among those who lost jobs in urban areas would be the children of these older people who are relying on them for support. So meaning even financially, in addition to social isolation, they would also be indirectly affected through their children. Same uh, old people in rural areas usually go for medical appointments in cities through their children. Many of them, uh, especially the very old ones, have uh, chronic medical complications. And therefore, uh, if their children are not traveling home because of uh, restrictions, much as it's possible to take, this, uh, to take a permit so that they take their parents to hospital, there was the fear of public places which might be infected and especially in urban areas. So many doctors opted to postpone medical appointments unless cases really required attention. And of course, the fear of contracting the virus was very strong among these uh, older people. 
So I felt that uh, this might be affecting their quality of life, but there was no way of determining that without a study. So that's why this study was conducted around uh, that time in consideration of the fact that quality of life of older persons is positively related to their psychosocial support, good health, and economic stability, all of which uh COVID-19 containment measures seemed to work against. So the media objective of the study, as I've said, is the impact of COVID-19 on the quality of life of older persons residing in rural areas. There were three specific objectives, namely to examine the uh, older person's level of awareness on COVID-19 because they wouldn't know the impact if they were not even aware of its existence. And since they were in rural areas, it was important to know whether they were aware of its existence and how it is spread and how to protect themselves. So the second objective looked at the relationship between COVID-19 awareness level, how much of COVID-19 they knew about, and extent of personal protection how what they were doing and how much of it to protect themselves and three to analyze the impact of covid 19 and its uh, containment measures on the quality of life of older persons to measure the impact uh three hypotheses were tested one uh, the quality of older persons is related to the extent of COVID-19 protection by oneself. That is, the measures the individuals put, did they relate to the quality of life? Second one is that quality of older persons, of life of older persons, is related to the extent of COVID-19 protection by one's children. Remember, these people are depending on their children for a lot of things, from financial to psychosocial. So the measures these children have put, including not visiting them, are they related to the quality of life of the older persons? And three, quality of life of older persons is related to the extent of COVID-19 protection by the community. The community in Kenya had also been advised and encouraged to try as much as possible to protect these older persons. One, by ensuring that they wash their hands before they visit these older people, by uh, trying as much as possible not to visit them unnecessarily, and generally to support them and protect them. So the study was a cross-sectional survey, and since it was conducted during the COVID era in Kenya, we are still having uh, infections, just like in many other countries. In May, it was going up, just like now, although now the rate has reduced slightly. So uh, because of the travel restrictions and the need to protect the older people, then the sample size uh, selected was 200. It's less than we would have liked, but uh, it is acceptable. A minimum size of 200 is needed to reduce a bias to an acceptable level because it was going to be a bit difficult to collect data from older persons without visiting them. Uh, but uh, we had to come up with something workable. So telephone calls were utilized and snowball sampling was done so that after getting the first person through the church, we got the first few individuals, we got their contacts, and then we had to use the, uh, the contacts, the few contacts we got from the first uh, religious leaders. Then we would contact the people and then ask them to give us, to refer us to somebody else who is around that age, age 70 for this study. Uh, was the minimum. So the target was all people aged 70 and above and residing in Nyeri County. Nyeri County is in central Kenya and is one of the counties with the highest population of older persons. Age 70 was selected because uh, people aged 70 years and above are given government stipends, financial. So it's easy to ask somebody to refer you to somebody else who goes for the financial stipend uh, with them. So that's why age 70 was uh, 
chosen. Then SPSS was used in data analysis. Out of the 200 targeted 156 uh, respondents uh, responded, that is a 78% response rate, a bit low, but uh, acceptable under the circumstances because there are those older persons who did not want to be interviewed. There are those who did not have telephone uh, lines. There are those who had uh, problems hearing properly, so we could not be able to fill their interview schedules. So there were a number of uh, challenges using telephone. Uh, the sociodemographic uh, distribution, they varied in age, gender, marital status, education level, and monthly income. As you can see from that uh, table 3.1, uh, uh, above 90 years, we only had 1.9%. Uh, in the marital status, uh, you can see that all of them were either married, 71%, or widowed at 28%. There was nobody who was single, separated, or uh, divorced. Uh, gender, we had more female than male. Almost two-thirds were female, uh, because in our population distribution at later years, we have more females than males, like in other uh, places. Education level, you note that about 30.8% had no formal education at all. Uh, traditionally, it was more difficult uh, for formal education, especially for the girls. The monthly income is a bit low. 10,000 Kenya shillings and below, that is around 100 uh, US dollars because 100 uh, Kenya shillings make one dollar, although right now with inflation it's about 108 shillings. So meaning if you divide any of that by 100, then you'll get the, uh, the dollars. So meaning 10,000 is about 100 US dollars per month, which is quite low and that 8.5% of them were getting that much. Uh, nobody was getting about uh, above 800 US dollars per month, meaning uh, the older person's income is a bit on the lower side. So uh, on the level of awareness of COVID-19, the respondents were simply asked whether they had ever heard of COVID-19. As seen on that table 3.2, all the respondents had heard of COVID-19. The source of information was mainly through the mass media, that is 84.6%, followed by family, and friends. Then uh, the study wanted to see whether there was a relationship between COVID-19 awareness and extent of personal protection. So we've already seen that all the respondents were aware of COVID-19, but to what extent were they aware? You know, how much of COVID-19 were they aware of? That was done by asking the respondents to describe the various ways they knew of that uh, COVID-19 was uh, spread and how they can protect themselves. So that measured the level of COVID-19 awareness. Extent of personal protection was measured by asking the respondents to describe the various uh, things they had done to ensure they're safe from COVID-19. And then they, uh, those who were able to describe uh, more Items were given more points, so somebody who was not able to describe anything would get a zero. If you described one method, then you'd get uh, a score of one. If you described two, you'd get a score of two. If you described either three or more, then you'd get a score uh, of three. The results are presented in table 3.8, uh, a chi-square test was done by constabulating those two. Uh, and the level of personal protection, it's the number of measures that the individual was taking. And on the level of COVID-19 awareness, it's the methods that the respondents were able to describe that uh, the mode of transmission of COVID-19. So uh, they were constabulated, a chi-square test was conducted 
And as you can see, the, the Pearson chi-square was significant with a value of 73, meaning that the relationship is significant. The more an individual knew about COVID-19, the more protection measures they undertook. The Spearman correlation coefficient was also significant with a value of 0 0.37. So much as it's not so strong, it's positive, and therefore, uh, it means the, the relationship was very significant. The more one knew, the more one took measures, implying the value of information. Next, we looked at the impact of COVID-19 on the quality of life of older persons. So uh, the hypothesis testing. We know so far that COVID-19 has negative effects on all aspects of life. It's documented everywhere and I've cited the UNDP. So the study determined quality of life by simply asking the respondents whether their well-being in four domains of interest, uh, that is financial, social, psychological, and health, had improved, remained the same, or deteriorated since the onset of COVID-19 pandemic. So the study assumed that when the, uh, before the pandemic started, everybody scored two on their quality of life or well-being in each of uh, the domains. So then if the, uh, after COVID-19, the quality of life or the well-being in the specific uh, domain wasn't, then they would score one. If it improved, they would score three. And if it remained the same, then they scored two. They remained with the two. Then the variable quality of life was computed by combining all the domains now, the financial, the social, the psychological, and the health. So meaning the maximum expected score would be 12 for a respondent whose quality of life improved in each of the four domains because they would score three in four domains, meaning 12. The one who, whose life had worsened in the particular domain all of them, all four of them, would score four because it means the life has worsened, that is one score, times four domains, meaning four scores. If uh, nothing had changed in any domain for a respondent, then they would score eight because it would be two, no effect, times four. Then uh, the frequencies were run and the scores are as presented in table 3.4 based on the quality of life of the respondents, the lowest was four, meaning there are respondents, 55.8% of them, meaning more than half of the respondents had their quality of life in each of the domains worsen. Uh, they were uh, considered to, be, to have a quality of life that had extremely deteriorated, you know, in all aspects. Then uh, the highest score was eight by only 1.9%. And eight means no effect, no quality of life had not changed at all. Meaning in the, among all respondents, nobody's life had improved. So the quality of life had either remained the same for 1.9 or worsened for all the others, 98.1. So how had uh, quality of life been affected by COVID-19? That is what I've just explained, that only 1.9% uh, had no effect. The others had worsened, you know, all of them. The, the study had uh, open-ended questions where they were supposed to say, uh, if they said that it had worsened, why? If it had improved, why? So that is just a summary that in the financial domain, uh, many respondents said that uh, the children who supported them were no longer able to after losing their jobs or having pay cuts. 
And for the respondents themselves, it was difficult to sell any farm uh, produce, either due to travel restrictions or fear of contracting the virus. Socially, many felt isolated because their children were not visiting them and even the neighbors uh, were reluctant to visit them in order to protect them. Hardships and hugs had been prohibited. Uh, physical distancing meant that uh, that close contact was reduced, so it affected them. Psychologically, many of them were afraid for their children who are in urban areas because they could easily get infected. And some of those students had lost their means of livelihood, so they did not know how they were surviving, yet some of them could not come home because of travel restrictions. Uh, also remember that many of them are afraid of getting infected and they know they are vulnerable, so they were thinking about death quite often. In the health domain, those with pre-existing medical conditions uh, usually go to the cities for medical treatment because that's where specialized treatment is uh, more and that is where many of their children work so they take them to those specialized doctors so with travel restrictions then it means many of them will not go to uh, it will be challenging to go to hospital and also their their children and the doctor would organize such that if the condition is not bad then they don't have to go for regular medical appointments unless absolutely necessary to avoid uh, any contact with the virus. So they had delayed hospital visits, they had some uh, appointments uh, postponed and they needed to avoid hospitals uh, as much as they could. So the three hypotheses were tested at this point. I think I had already mentioned the hypothesis relationship between quality of life and the extent of COVID-19 protection by the individual himself. The second one was on the relationship between quality of life and the extent of protection by the children. And the third one is a relationship between quality of life and the extent of protection by the community, the neighboring communities usually. So hypothesis one, on the relationship between quality of life and extent of COVID-19 uh, protection uh, is there. So the same way of testing where the number of measures given would be uh, scored using a Likert scale. If it's one, then uh, one measure is given, then they would get one score. If it's two, they would get two scores. If there are three or more, they would get uh, three scores. So one would be considered minimum protection, two would be moderate, and three and above would be high level protection or protective measures being taken. Quality of life was categorized into two to make sure that we don't have any cells with less than five frequencies to meet the chi-square requirement. So low and high uh, categories. Uh, and remember nobody's life had improved. It had either remained the same or worsened. So even the quality of life that is high, it only means that it has not worsened to a very high degree. The one that is low, it means the deterioration in quality of life is very much. So it's not about high quality of life or low one. It only means uh, that they scored high scores because the deterioration is not so much and uh, low uh, scores because the deterioration was uh, very much. So uh, in this relationship then, the Pearson chi-square was insignificant, implying that the relationship between quality of life and extent uh, of COVID-19 protection by oneself, the measures that the person put uh, was not significant. So it did not affect the quality of life. The measures the individuals themselves put did not affect their quality of life. Hypothesis two is the relationship between quality of life and extent of, of COVID-19 protection by one's children. And here, the relationship was significant. The Pearson chi-square was significant. And the Spearman correlation uh, coefficient was also significant with a value of negative 0 0.316, meaning that the relationship is inverse. 
the more protective measures that children put for their parents, the lower their quality of life got. So meaning the more they stayed away, the more they made sure their parents don't go out much, the lower their quality of life uh, became. Then hypothesis three, relationship between quality of life and the extent of COVID-19 protection by community members. Again, the Pearson chi-square was significant and the Spearman correlation coefficient was significant and inverse again with a value of negative 0 0.335, implying again that the more measures the community put to protect these older persons, the lower their quality of life got. So uh, meaning uh, measures put by children and the community uh, only made the quality of life of the older persons go uh, deteriorate more. Uh, maybe mainly because of uh, the fact that they could not interact uh, with them much, or maybe because they were not involved in the decisions that children should, would just decide we'll not go home because we don't want to infect our elderly parents also. So in, uh, in conclusion, uh, the study found that the pandemic had uh, negatively affected the quality of life of almost all older persons, you know, 98% of them, because it's only 1.9% who had not been affected. Nobody was affected positively. Nobody's quality of life had improved. The findings also showed uh, that there was no relationship between the quality of life and the COVID-19 containment measures that were put by the respondents themselves, meaning that measures that individuals decide to put do not affect their quality of life. But measures put by others, including the children, the loved ones, the community, and everyone else, negatively or inversely affected their quality of life like we've seen in this study. So that simply means uh, that to put these containment measures because they must be put, it is important to discuss with the older persons so that they are involved in how they will be put, how they will be observed, where, when, and how, so that they will not affect their quality of life. And the suggestion given here in this conclusion is that uh, probably the reason the quality of life was uh, negatively affected by the measures, containment measures put by children and society is probably uh, they had painful psychosocial effects because of isolation and loneliness uh, and the fact that they had not been forewarned, you know, uh, uh, children just don't come home as much as they did before. Uh, social gatherings, including family gatherings, would be cancelled and therefore the older persons in their rural dwellings felt a bit lonely. It's also possible that older persons are not happy with measures that individuals just impose without consulting them, even when the intention is good. So need for consultations. Uh, when implementing missions. So the study recommends that uh, while uh, physical and social distancing is the best guarantee to avoid COVID-19 infection, it is important for the family and friends to involve the older persons when making those decisions on how to keep them safe. Secondly, that physical distancing should be observed without making the older persons feel guilty for being vulnerable. You know, when they feel that the reason that people are, that the children are not going home is because they want to keep them safe, then they feel that their vulnerability is also affecting their children. So it should be done in a more humane uh, way by through discussions and uh, making them understand why it's necessary to do that. Then if possible, alternative means of social interaction with older persons in, living in rural areas should be sought. Uh, for example, more use of technology, you know, video calls so that they can still see face to face even when they may not have to meet uh, physically in order to reduce feelings of isolation. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.
any questions are welcome. Yeah. Many thanks, uh, Pauline, for your presentation. I think we have a few minutes left for questions. So are there any questions from the attendees? Yeah, Kadia, I'll ask a question and... Okay, um, are you listening to me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay. First of all, it was a very interesting and informative presentation. I congratulate you. Um, Thank you. Uh, but Welcome. Uh, but I have some uh, um, suggestion. Uh, yeah. If you uh, um, if you like uh, scroll up your uh, slide number eight, please. Number eight. Yes, I'm going there. Yes. There? Slide number, yeah. Uh, over here, like uh, uh, as far as your monthly income is concerned, um, uh -huh. Uh, the categories which you have like put in is like uh, a little bit of like uh, self-controlled, um, like 10,000 below. Uh, it seems like you have controlled these categories, um, but if you look in pure statistical terms, we have very nice tools for that. Like uh, you can divide your population in terms of income quintiles, uh -huh. like the lower uh, uh -huh. the bottom uh, quintile up till the fifth uh, uppermost quintile. So okay. I would appreciate if you like make the categories in terms of like uh, quintile income quintiles rather than uh, these uh, um, uh, self-made kind of like categories. I would appreciate it, please. Oh, thank you very much. Point <laughs> noted and taken and appreciated. Thank you so okay. much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for your uh, last question. Um, are there other questions from the attendees? Check the box. Then, Pauline, I have a question. Yes. What I was very interested in is your, your study area. So you pick a uh, specific region of Kenya, Nigeri? Yeah, uh, Kenya, Nigeri, yes. In, uh, if you would look at that area, how representative is it for the uh, whole of Kenya? Is, is it a very urban area or rural area or mixed? Um, yeah, Nyeri is in the central region of Kenya. It has the urban population and the rural one. It's more rural than urban, but the study only looked at the rural population. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Welcome. Other questions? No? Then, Pauline, I would like to thank you very much for your uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you, too. And I would like to, and I'll try to put myself on screen while my video doesn't work anymore, but I would like to thank all the uh, attendees uh, for participating. Ah, there I am. And um, well, the session ends and it's now uh, lunch break. And we continue again our sessions at uh, 1.30. Uh, and you will find the, uh, the session link in the schedule. So for now, enjoy your lunch or dinner or midnight snack. And uh, we see each other. Thank you so much.